This is the Horse Radio Network. This is episode 265 of the Stable Scoop Radio Show, the all food episode. Please support our sponsors as they make this show possible. Our sponsors this week are Equisketch. You can find them at equisketch.com and Kentucky Performance Products at kppusa.com. Welcome to the Stable Scoop, with weekly shows delivered right to you. With Helena and Glenn the Geek, live from the stable, it's every week. They bring you the news through hay or high water, while using their tails as their own fly swatters. Sit on down and laugh till your poop Cause it's time again for Stable Scoop Stable Scoop Stable Scoop Stable Scoop I am Glenn the Geek And I'm Helena B And you're listening to the Stable Scoop Radio Show On the Horse Radio Network I am so excited for this episode, Helena Want to know why? Want to know why? Want to know why? Yes, Glenn. I want to know why. Wait, does it have to do with the word F-O-O-D? Food! My favorite topic in the whole world. Even, yes, above horses, I'm sorry to say, because I am a horse husband first, and you know what that means. I still am a guy, and we like to eat. So uh, even on my diet, I still like to eat. Uh, and this whole episode is going to be dedicated to eating, me eating specific. No, actually, it's going to be dedicated to food. And to help us out, we have one of our good friends and also a horsewoman and a food blocker. And we have Kat from Eat Your Tart Out with us for the whole entire episode. Hello, Woo-hoo! Kat. Yay. Hi, guys. Thanks for having me. Basically, it was free help. We got free help for the whole entire episode. <laughs> well, I don't know if it's help necessarily, because I have a feeling like halfway into this, you guys are probably going to be wanting to stab me because I'm making you so hungry with everything. So don't <laughs> thank me just yet. And I'm sure that is what's going to happen today, too. Did you eat anything before the show today, Helena? A grapefruit. Big mistake. We should have had a big <laughs> piece of chocolate cake or something. Oh, uh. <laughs> Well, I had an Oreo. I had Oreo ice cream with hot fudge and whipped cream on it for lunch yesterday. Does that count? That that's good, right? Oh, that's that a good. Sounds one. delicious. Yeah, it does. It was, it was good. It was good. <laughs> you are leading the life of a bachelorette. That is for sure. <laughs> no, I'm leading the life of the mother of a ten year old. <laughs> But I still do that. So what does that say about me? <laughs> uh, <laughs> I don't know. What does it say about you, Kat? I just really like ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is going to be fun. Tell everybody about the guests that we have coming up on today that you have booked for today's show. See, this is what I meant. We really do have the day off. We're just going to let Kat talk, and we're going to sit back and eat. Well, okay. Well, I'm ready to roll with it. Uh, <laughs> our first guest that we have today is a really good friend of mine. It's Phyllis LeBlanc. Um, she is owner of Harbor Sweets, and the horse world may better know her as the woman behind Dark Horse Chocolates. And we'll definitely talk a lot more about her, but she's a dressage rider. She's on the board for the New England Dressage, dressage Association, but she also has this passion for chocolates that she's been able to integrate horses into. So I'm really excited to be able to talk about her because it's not very often when you can combine your two passions like that, and she's able to, which is really cool. Terrific. And you have a second guest coming on today as well. Sure. And our second guest is Kate Samuels, and she is um, part of Eventing Nation, which I'm pretty sure everybody has heard about you know, in this day and age, but she's also an event rider and she's aspiring to really go full time with her eventing career, but she's also got a background in food. So when she was in college, she actually uh, decided to teach herself how to bake and was able to become a pastry chef. And she makes these amazing dishes and dinner parties for her friends now. And I thought it'd be just really fun to talk about her and her horses and all the things that she's doing with that as well. And, you know, I know some of our listeners, no, they're probably not. Our regular listeners are not asking this question. The new listeners might be asking, why are they doing a whole episode about food? Well, when Helena and I started this show, we said that the show was going to be, yes, 
centric to horses, but also was going to be about the lives of horse people. And one of the things that we all do three, four times a day, in my case, maybe six or seven, is eat. So, uh, you know, that it is part of life and it's part of part of what we do. And, and we all find a way to incorporate it into our busy schedules with horses. And, you know, that's part of what I like about Eat Your Tart Out, Cat, is you've been able to do some posts and some things that uh, are easier to do, you know, are easier to make that really do fit with horse people a little bit better. Well, absolutely. And that's why, you know, I know we were going to talk about it later, or, but we can talk about it now, is, is that I've joined up with Sideline Magazine, and that's something that I'm going to be doing more as an ongoing basis, because we've kind of realized that the horse people that I'm associated with love going to eat your tart out to find those easier recipes, but I can't exactly post about horse stuff on there because foodies are kind of poo-pooing the whole horse thing, which is fine, you know, so I can separate the world out a little bit, and that's what Sidelines is helping me to do. But more specifically, you look at the equestrian lifestyle, and you're so cramped for time. Most people have a full-time job. They go out, they play with their horses in the evenings, or they show on the weekends, and there's so little time. You know, you're going to be doing things like dinner parties. You're going to be trying to get dinner on the table that isn't fast food or delivered, and the whole blog and column that I'm going to be starting called Good Food Hunting with Sidelines is going to be promoting that lifestyle and really catering to equestrians. Well, that sounds terrific. It really does. It really does sound. Now, Helena, do you, find, do you cook a lot do you, do, or do you eat ice cream every day for lunch? <laughs> you know what? I am starting to cook a lot more now than I had ever in the past. And, so. and, and that, do you, is Gracie a good, this is your daughter and she's what, 10 or 11 now. Yep. Is she a good eater or is she, you know, want the chicken nuggets every day? No, she has a really good palate. Um, she's got a very sophisticated palate. She absolutely loves vegetables. She prefers them raw. <laughs> she thinks cooking ruins them. <laughs> God bless her. Um, <laughs> no, she's good. She loves fish. She loves meat prepared in a variety of ways. She will eat pretty much uh, just about anything. So when I cook, I mean, I do have to take her tastes into consideration, but it's not like I can't cook with garlic or spices or, or things like that, which, which makes cooking actually more fun and makes me, it inspires me to cook. Definitely, definitely. You know, we, uh, I know so many parents with kids that have such a tough time with that, that it, it does become an issue. Kat, tell us, uh, you've had some adventures here recently and have, have uh, had some travels that have involved food. And one of them I was very jealous about because you went up to New England and you got to spend a lot of time at my favorite place. And, and Helena's too. I think I can speak for Helena at this. Wegmans. You got to spend time at Wegmans, which I just don't have any here in Florida. I know. It's breaking my heart because I don't know if your listeners know this or not, but one of the things that I went through this past December is I moved from Massachusetts and New England to Missouri. And it's been a huge change for a lot of reasons, but most importantly, and my poor boyfriend thinks I'm absolutely nuts, which is fine, <laughs> um, is just I had to give up Wegmans. And for those of you who don't know, Wegmans is a grocery store that's based out of Rochester, New York. They're still family owned. Unlike and any other. I know. They really are. They've got the most amazing selection of everything, and I just get so excited about going. So, yes, I spent so much time when I was there, and now, um, tomorrow, I'm actually leaving to go to D.C. to visit my sister, and it just happens that 20 miles from where my sisters lives, they're opening up a new Wegmans on the weekend I'm going to be there. Oh, so, my God. Oh, my God. <laughs> so, poor Greg, again, is going to have to be dragged to this stuff that he is just not interested in at all but i'm very excited to be able to go there it's a little they call them wag maniacs for the people who show up and they will come from all over the place to come to these grand openings but i will be that person coming from many states way just to enjoy it <laughs> do they give away free food and you just get to eat your way through the store a little bit i mean when I, the one happened in massachusetts uh last year yeah it was not that long ago um, it was a little insane. Like you basically were get, like herding cattle through the store. It was very hard. You just kind of had to go with things and grab things as you went along, not really knowing what you were ending up with. And in a lot of ways, <laughs> you know, it was fun, but it was a little um, chaotic. So I'm hoping we're coming back from Pennsylvania at that point. So I'm really hoping it'll die down by the time we get to it. If not, 
it still gets to see a new store and things like that. They've got like an underground like parking garage, which is new for Wegman. So there's a lot of things I'm looking forward to. <laughs> Ugh. It's one of the things Helene and I look forward to the most about going to the Ada show in Philadelphia is yeah. that there's a Wegmans the next exit up. That's a- I will never forget the first time you brought me into Wegmans there. And you You're thought, like, oh, I said, let's go eat at the grocery store. And she was like, what? <laughs> yeah. I was like, I love you, but isn't that like really nice steakhouse a few doors down a better opportunity, better ch- chance? And then... We walked in the doors and I looked around and it was like this light from heaven shone down upon all the places in Wegmans that you could possibly go and the bakery and the cheese section and then the buffets. Yeah. And I looked at Glenn in a whole new way with a whole <laughs> new level of respect. Jennifer and I, the first night we got there, what, a couple of weeks ago when we, you, you were there, the first night we got there, we went up and we had dinner at Wegmans. That's the first thing we do when we get there. <laughs> that's, like, that's funny. So what else did you do in Boston besides hang out at our favorite grocery store? Um, I went to, I did another Boston chocolate walking tour again. Um, sorry, it's Boston chocolate tours. There's another imposter company that's in Boston that is not nearly <laughs> as good as these ones. So I have to clarify. Um, but I'm actually, that's another opportunity I'm working on is I'm going to start blogging for them specifically about chocolate. Oh, wow. I know. Where did you so, go? I know. It's pretty amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but yeah, so they invited me to go on another tour, which I had been on already, but you know, free chocolate is pretty easy sell for me. So I just kind of went along with it and yeah, that's what I got to do in Boston. And then one of the other, um, now wait a minute, let's stop there. So they're going to send you chocolate (laughs) to eat and then write about. Well, it's a little yes and no to that one. Um, so what I'm going to be doing for Boston Chocolate Tours is I'm actually going to be writing about chocolate recipes. That's going to be kind of my like little niche that I'm going to do for them. But what I did, and I felt like such a weirdo when I came back from Boston, is that I probably purchased about 30 chocolate bars, which, Glenn, I've had you on the air try chocolate bars before. And this time... <laughs> When it gets a little cooler to ship stuff, I'm actually going to put them in there and not tell you what they are, and then we're going to taste them on the air. She sends me, Helena, <laughs> some of the weirdest chocolate you've ever heard oh, of. These are even weirder, if you can imagine <laughs> it. Like, I just specifically bought them because they were so crazy. And then I've she makes never- me do it on the live show, so I have to cringe and, you know, just want to throw up on the live show. Actually, the, the, some of the ones that sounded really strange turned out to be pretty good. Right, which is why I like doing it. So you just don't know. But this time I'm going to do a blind taste test. And uh, all you do is look and smell before you taste it. Oh, no. I'm not even going to know what I'm putting in there. Just as long as it doesn't involve sushi, okay? No sushi chocolate. I don't I'm, yeah, I'm not going to send them. Well, actually, funny enough, there is a chocolate store in uh, Boston that sells caramel sushi rolls, and uh, they are fantastic. They roll caramel and marshmallow together, and they cut it like a little sushi roll and dip it in chocolate. Oh, well, now that oh, sounds oh. good. Yeah. yeah, but I'm not sending you those because that's too, like... Because she ate them all. <laughs> that's why. Let's be honest here. All right, okay. let's take a break for our uh, our first sponsor of the day, Kentucky Performance Products, with a nutrition minute, ironically enough, for this show. <laughs> and then we're going to be back with our first guest, Phyllis LeBlanc, will be here of Harbor Suites. This Nutrition Minute is brought to you by Kentucky Performance Products, the company that simplifies your search for research-proven nutritional supplements at kppusa.com. Have you heard of a yeast called Saccharomyces boulardii? It's a type of probiotic that benefits your horse's digestive tract. Often referred to as S. boulardii, it works in several different ways. One unique property of S. boulardii is that it supports the stimulation of the enzymes found in the intestinal lining. These enzymes help your horse digest starches and sugars in the small intestine. When the sugars and starches are more completely digested, fewer of them escape into the hindgut where they can ferment and cause imbalances that may lead to colic, diarrhea, and laminitis. Saccharomyces boulardii is found in Nalox Advanced, made by Kentucky Performance Products. Nalox Advanced contains a blend of yeast, fermentation solubles, and stomach buffers. 
These ingredients work together to maintain your horse's digestive tract in peak condition. Nalox Advanced is recommended for horses of all ages and stages and is fed on a daily basis. This Nutritional Minute has been brought to you by Kentucky Performance Products. You can find all of their terrific products at kppusa.com. Well, today with us, we have Phyllis LeBlanc of Harbor Suites, and she is not only a very good friend of mine, but she also is a dressage rider. She's on the NIDA board, which is the New England Dressage Dressage Association. I cannot get that word right today. (laughs) And she also helms Dark Horse Chocolates, which is part of Harbor Suites. So hello, Phyllis. How are you today? Hi, Kat. I'm great. How are you? Very good. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. We're really glad we can get you here and talk about chocolate. Well, it's my pleasure. I love to talk about chocolate. (laughs) Well, you're celebrating 40 years this month, and that's pretty exciting. It is. And um, I actually have was not the founder of the company. The company was founded by Ben Strohecker, who has um, been my mentor for 36 years. And when I started with Harbor Suites, just after they moved out of Ben's basement. Um, and so I've had a, a long run with the company and actually bought the company about 14 years ago. Okay, and that, and I know, but I want you to tell all the listeners today, so that time when you made the transition, how did Dark Horse Chocolates come into play with all of this? <laughs> well, Dark Horse Chocolates um, was my grad school project. I was studying for my master's degree nights at Boston University, and I was president of Harbor Suites at the time, and I was in a course on entrepreneurship and had to write a business plan. So I was out looking for gifts for my trainer and my blacksmith, and I couldn't really find anything that was really nice but not too personal. You know, I didn't have to know what size they wore or something like that. So um, it occurred to me that everybody loves chocolate, and what would be better than chocolate with horses for all of these gifts? So I wrote my business plan um, on developing a line of chocolates um, with equestrian designs and packaging them as gifts. And at the time, um, I did not own the company, and Harbor Sweets was all, the chocolates were all nautically oriented. And the I was wondering did, about that because of the name. I, I often wondered that. Yes, well, yeah. that's the background, and that that's a great story, too. But um, we... It took me a while to convince the owner that we should actually think about launching this line. I thought about taking it out on my own um, and setting up an independent company, but I loved what I was doing and the folks I was working with. So I managed to convince him, and we launched the line, and it paid for all of the development costs in the first four weeks that it was on the market. Oh, (laughs) wow. It was great, and it took off, and uh, it was uh, within a year or two after that that I ended up buying the company. So it's, it's been a wonderful success for me and fun to bring what I love into the business that can, I so enjoy. Can I tell you a little secret? Because we've been, we've been selling Dark Horse chocolates when I worked in retail for a long time. And I worked for a pretty major retail company. And we would pray for the day that the chocolates went out of date. <laughs> and we would go back to the warehouse and raid the warehouse, and we would just sit back there, open them all up, and eat them all at once. We would just <laughs> gorge on Dark Horse chocolates for that day. We loved well, that day that we could write off those chocolates. Well, that's good because we, we'd want you to eat them all pretty quickly once they reach that date. You know? <laughs> <laughs> we did. It wasn't any problem at all. And then if, if, if they sold real well that season, it was like, darn, there's none out of date. We would just, I would hide some so that they would, and then put them back in the box on the shelf so that, uh, yeah, that was bad. When, I can't help it. Right. I like chocolate. You work for yourself now. <laughs> yes, that's right. Now we yeah, I can't do that. It's my that. money. <laughs> oh, by the way, Glenn. Yeah. I really like dark horse chocolates, and it, you know, Christmas is coming up, and. Oh, okay. I'll keep that in know, mind. <laughs> just saying. Just, just saying. <laughs> I'm sorry. Go ahead, Cat. <laughs> no, it's fine. Well, funny you should speak of Christmas because they have a lot of really great items. And Phyllis, I don't know if you just want to tell us a little bit. I mean, you start planning for Christmas way in advance anyway, so I don't know if you want to give us a little sneak peek of what is going to be on the lineup this year. 
Sure, I'd love to. We have some great new items. Um, one of our fast becoming a classic, although it's only in the third year that we've had it, is our Dark Horse Chocolate Christmas Calendar. And that's a wonderful treat. It has a chocolate behind each of the 25 doors leading up to Christmas. And oh, cool. um, it has a wonderful theme on the front painted by our friend who is an artist, Jocelyn Urban Sander, and she does a terrific job. And this year's edition has um, all of your barnyard friends, the cats and dogs and horses and cows decorating the Christmas tree out in the field. So it's it's a great scene, um, a lot of fun, and you have to exercise great discipline to just eat the one chocolate a day as you work your way to, up to the holiday. Now, I'd have to buy 30 of them so that I could just eat all of them every day. <laughs> See, that would solve the problem. Well, I had a, a wonderful story about... Um, a woman that came in at a show that we were doing, and she had seven children, and she was buying one calendar. And I said, really? Um, <laughs> and she said, oh, yes, they'll share. And the children were with her, and they had planned to draw a, a, a number each day. All of the children drew numbers up to the 25 days, and that was their day to get the chocolates. And I thought, this woman is amazing if she has children that are that well behaved. <laughs> but I guess if you have seven children, you must, right? <laughs> so, so that's that's a fun item. And then we have a, a fabulous um, cloth covered box, and it's shaped like a miniature hat box, and that's handmade here in the U.S. Um, by a local manufacturer, and the artwork on the top has four young horses. It's actually called Four Yearlings, and this is a fine art piece done by, again, by Jocelyn Urban Sander, and makes a lovely gift. It's filled with an assortment of both the milk and dark chocolate, um, six different flavors. So once the people have finished the chocolates, they have this lovely box to keep afterwards. Um, and the third thing that I'm very excited about is it looks like a takeout box, like you might have at a Chinese restaurant, but it's all sparkly red coated. And inside of that are two bags of the Dark Horse chocolates, um, our dressage classics, the almond butter crunch covered in dark chocolate, and the Foxtrot, which is a milk chocolate covered creamy caramel. And that is by far the best takeout you will ever have, and it makes a terrific hostess gift. <laughs> I am hungry. I know, me too. <laughs> Just thinking, I don't have a piece of chocolate in the house. <laughs> Does anybody, do you even have chocolate in the house, Cat? I don't have any. You do. You uh, have 85 bars that you're waiting I, to sell. I have, like, um, but the sad thing is, is I had a lovely tasting of Harbor Sweet's new line, Salt and Air, that's coming out. And I devoured that like instantaneously. Again, poor Greg got like one piece, and he's like, "Where's the rest?" I'm like, "I couldn't help it." <laughs> so, so do I take it that you liked our new line? Oh my gosh, Phyllis, it is fantastic! It is so 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 good. Um, I have. It's just absolutely the definitely the almond butter crunch with the chipotle sea salt was fantastic. Love that. But I think my favorite was probably the chai, the chai truffle. I love the chai, too. But, you know, uh, it's funny. People ask me which is my favorite, and I just absolutely can't decide. I say, oh, well, the salt caramel is really great. That's a fabulous piece. But I also love crystallized ginger, and we've topped it with um, a 70% dark chocolate and a Thai ginger sea salt, and that's fabulous. And then we have a hazelnut truffle and the chai, an espresso truffle and cafe au lait. So it's it's, it's, it's really become a thing lately with chefs to combine the chocolate with heat, with the chipotle, with chilies and things like that. <clears throat> is that it, am, am I just making that up, or is that a recent thing that's become very popular? No, you're not making that up. There are a couple of things um, trends in the food industry, and Kat can probably speak to this as well. But um, we we were at the fancy food show a month ago, two months ago now, launching this line, and it's always interesting to see. Um, oh wait a minute! There's the, something called the fancy food show. Yeah, I know. It is, it's, it's <laughs> and we missed it. Did we miss it? Why weren't we invited? <laughs> 
<laughs> well, it's it's in New York at the Javits Center, and there are over twenty five hundred vendors. And oh my God! Sells... Do you get taste everything? Yes, <gasps> every single person there practically is sampling their product. So oh, it's it's a bit overwhelming, <laughs> but um, all of the top gift and gourmet stores um, in the country and from all over the world go to this show to discover what's new and to meet with the vendors. And it's, it's really fun. Helena road trend. trip, road trip. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, it, is a tri- it is open to the trade. So you have to have well, a we're reporters. <laughs> Do we count as reporters? Are we good media? Probably. You can yeah. probably get in as press. <laughs> Yeah, we'll do but it, it under the a heat fabulous show. Out. Yeah, we'll do it under cat. We're we're your we're your diligent reporters. Okay, there sounds you. good. Yeah. <laughs> wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> we will make it work. <laughs> Glenn will make it work. Right. I'll start a food show if I have to. <laughs> I'll just wear my paddock boots and it makes it official. There you, you go. Know, <laughs> or we can just say, Oh, you have a horse? I have a horse too. Boom. Now, let me ask you a quick question I'm curious about is when you took over, I assume that Harbor Suites was still making, you know, suites that had Harbor type lighthouses and stuff on them. Are you still in the in the nautical suite business or has it all been switched to horses at this point? Oh, no, no, no. We still do our Harbor Suites um, line of chocolates. That's actually the major portion of our business. Um, The Dark Horse chocolates, while it's while it's a lot of fun for me, it's only about 10% of our business. Oh, wow. um, and it's, it's a great line and a very targeted audience. Um, and the people are fun. And, you know, as a, as a rider, I really enjoy working within that. But our company is much larger than the Dark Horse Chocolates. We, we have the Harbor Sweets line, which is sold in gift and gourmet shops all over the country. We do a line called Perennial Sweets, which has gardening designs, our Dark Horse Chocolates, and now the Salt and Air line, and we also have sugar-free chocolates. So we have a lot of things going on here. Well, great, Phyllis. Well, thank you so much. I think our time's just about up, but can you tell everybody where they can find you and your chocolates? Absolutely. Um, you can find us online at harborsweets.com, and that's H-A-R-B-O-R-S-W-E-E-T-S. Um, you can call for a catalog at our 800 number. is 800-243-2115, and we'd be happy to send out a catalog or um, let you know what we have available. Sure. And can I just add, Kat, that Phyllis is one of the sweetest dressage riders I've ever met. <laughs> uh, you well, see what I have to you, deal Glenn, with. And thanks, Elena and Kat. It's been great fun. All right, Our pleasure. You. Thanks, Phyllis. Well, that was fun. I really am getting hungry. I don't know about you guys, but I'm really getting hungry. And I really don't think I have a piece of chocolate anywhere in the house. No. I mean, oh, you know, I have a, I have a jar of hot fudge. Oh, that'll work. Oh, hot fudge is just going to eat it right out of the jar. <laughs> oh, hold on. I'll be right back. I got I to pee. <laughs> we'll be right back with uh, Kat's second guest, Kate. Kate Samuels, who is a, a venter, a rider, and also really, really into food. And I love learning about people's life outside of what they do with the horses. So we're going to talk to her in just a minute, right after we hear from Equisketch about their terrific app, the Records app. Glenn the Geek here. The life of horse person is hard enough, and we all hate doing the required paperwork, and unfortunately many of us never get around to it, and it just piles up on our desk. That is about to change thanks to the Equisketch Records app for your iPhone or iPad. My wife and I use it to track our horses, and we absolutely love this thing. Equisketch Records is the most thorough and complete equestrian records app on the market today. We love this app because you can track your farrier work, your dental, your Coggins, medicines, worming, and so much more. And you can get reminders on your device when all of these things are due. You'll never forget a worming or shots or farrier visit again. But it not only tracks your horse, you can also manage your horse shows, including individual events. You can manage riders, including lessons and memberships and so much more. And you can sync it between your iPhone and your iPad and all of this for the price of a couple of cups of coffee from Starbucks. 
Search for EquiSketch Records in the iOS App Store or go to EquiSketch.com. That's E-Q-U-I-S-K-E-T-C-H.com. EquiSketch.com. Next on our lineup, we have Kate Samuels. And Kate, in my world, is known for her food um, contacts that she has. But more so for this show and for our horse people listening, she is involved with Eventing Nation. So, hey, Kate, how are you doing today? Great. How are you, Kat? Great. Thank you so much for joining us and willing to talk about food because I know you talk about horses probably more than you want to or maybe a lot. (laughs) So it's a good kind of segue into one of your other passions that you have. Yeah, I pretty much only talk about horses, so I'm actually really excited to talk about food. (laughs) Well, very good. So why don't you tell us a little bit about your involvement with food and how it kind of came to be and where you are at with it? currently? Um, so I, I guess I grew up in a very, um, a family that's very interested in food, um, kind of typical upbringing. My grandmother is, uh, you know, a deep Southern Baptist who has a giant family, um, lunch every Sunday where everyone comes and she cooks, you know, a ridiculously huge feast. Um, she's really into pie, uh, which probably started, my interest in baked goods. Um, and she's also given me several of her own handwritten, uh, recipe books that are just unbelievable. Um, and so, you know, I kind of grew up having a lot of appreciation for some good home cooking. Um, I actually on a whim applied for a job as a sous chef, uh, one year when I was in college, um, during the winter, I couldn't really ride very much, so I decided I needed to make some money and was living in town near a bunch of restaurants. So I applied for a job, um, and I had no actual legitimate experience other than cooking for my roommates and having them eat all my food. Um, but I showed up to my interview with a uh, warm apple buttermilk custard pie, and I told them... <laughs> that I was a very quick learner. I would work really hard. I was used to long hours because I worked in the barn all the time and that I would not cry. And they said (laughs) I was hired. (laughs) I love that one. (laughs) That's essential. I worked in a kitchen. uh, I worked in a kitchen for four years. It was very busy. We had lines 24 hours a day. And let me tell you, we laughed at that, but I can't tell you how many people I saw working in that kitchen crying. Yeah, well, I told them I wouldn't. I said you could be as mean as you want, and I won't cry. So they were like, great. Um, So I got a job as a sous chef for two years, and, um, you know, luckily the the restaurant that I got it at was was just kind of starting up, so they were able to kind of spend, you know, the first few months really teaching me how everything was supposed to go, and that was great. Um, And I really enjoyed working there. It was was really fun. And now um, I work full-time with my horses, and with other people's horses, but I still really enjoy um, having my friends over and cooking them, you know, a four course meal. And um, I really, really like baking, but the problem with baking is if you make a pie, then you got to find a bunch of people to eat it. Or I just sit at home by myself and eat a pie. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I have that same problem. I love to bake, but if it sits in my house too long, I will devour the entire thing. So I'm surprised I'm yeah. not 400 pounds because I live now <laughs> in such a rural area that I don't have a lot of friends yet. So I feel like that closet eater at home, which I'm admitting way too much <laughs> on the air. So why don't you keep talking? <laughs> well, I've, I've discovered that, um, you can pay a lot of people in the country with pie um, for, for random favors. Like if I, if I have a tree fall on my property and I need someone to come with their big giant tractor and chop it up and move it for me, I can pay them with a few pies and they'll be great with that. (laughs) (laughs) So, you know, you find ways. Yeah, actually, when I was I was selling my baked goods down at a farmer's market for a while just to kind of get out and meet the local people in my community, and for a while, I just wasn't selling stuff because it was just getting too humid, so I was giving it away to the vendors there, and I kept coming home with bags and bags and bags of beautiful vegetables and fruits and things, and here I am like, I'm giving you guys the really unhealthy stuff, and I'm getting the healthy stuff, so I thought I really lucked out that way. <laughs> <laughs> Now tell us when you were working as a as a sous chef, um, was it what kind of restaurant was it? 
Um, so I live in uh, Charlottesville, which is a big university town because of uh, University of Virginia. Yeah. And um, I was just working at like a, a pretty generic uh, whatever you want American food restaurant. Um, but we did have a pretty gourmet dinner menu. Um, we had, you know, like handmade fettuccine alfredo where I had to like roll out and cut out the, the pasta and, you know, make it myself and um, everything we bought was from local farms and, you know, the farmer's market we would go to. Um, so it was actually pretty gourmet for, for a, you know, a college restaurant. Um, and the, the chef that hired me was not that much older than me, but very knowledgeable and really good at teaching me how to do every step, like all of the basics. He was really good at explaining it. Um, you were lucky because there's so many chefs that I've met along the way that aren't very good at that, and they expect you just by osmosis to figure it out. And yeah. it's tough. I mean, it is tough. And, and they have all the little tricks, but they're they're always afraid to, to teach you. So you were lucky to find one like that. Yeah, I think it helped that he wasn't um, he wasn't too much older than me. So um, we we're kind of in the same boat where he probably this was probably his first job as a head chef. So he was excited to have that, and he wasn't snobbish about having someone who was a little less knowledgeable than they probably should have been. Yeah. Now, do you have any tips that you learned from that experience that are like good things to be able to pass on to our listeners? Oh, um, I think I learned that. I think a lot of people are, are scared to start cooking because they don't know what they're doing. Um, and, and a lot of cooking, just like riding horses, is about feel. Like, does it look the way you think it should? Or does, you know, does the meat feel the way it should? And, and kind of the only way to get that is by experience and by trying it and messing up and then, you know, trying it again and, and figuring it out, like how to kind of figure it out outside of strictly math and measurements and stuff. And I think people kind of stay away from cooking because they're afraid they're going to, you know, totally char the chicken. But every once in a while, you have to do that in order to figure out how to cook it properly. You know, what I had in my mind when you were saying that, it comes to mind every time I hear about uh, people trying, trying again, cooking is the movie Julia Julia, the, that movie. Yeah. Where she's in that scene where she's trying to do, what was that French thing she was trying to do a hundred times and never could get Le it right? Bourguignon. Yeah, there you Le go. Bourguignon. <laughs> yes. There you go. <laughs> Love that scene. <laughs> yeah, but that's what it is. I mean, it's, you know, it's trial and error, and if you never go into the kitchen and start trying, then, then you're really not going to learn how to cook. <laughs> <laughs> so what's your challenge going to be, Kat? Oh, you know, she chose, she was a food blogger, one of the first, actually, and she chose to cook her way through Julia's book. So what are you cooking your way through? Well, funny enough, when I moved, I decided that I've saved every food magazine I've ever come across, which when you realize when you have to move all of that stuff, it it's a lot. And I feel like a bit of a hoarder because of that. So what I did prior to moving to Missouri is I actually ripped out all the recipes that interest me in some way. And, you know, I had dog-eared them back then. But then, you know, as I learned more, I kind of say, hey, that might be a really good way to introduce myself to mussels. I might not be into it. You know, things like that. And so now I've got a smaller stack, albeit a still a large stack. And that's one of my things is, is once a month I try um, to go through one of those recipes and try it out. And from there, I'll tailor it, kind of make it my own and do things like that. So that's actually what I'm doing is one of my background projects. But as I've told you guys, I'm kind of running out of time, but it's in the background that I'm working on. <laughs> gotcha. And how about you, Kate? You're busy doing the eventing thing and over there with John at Eventing Nation. Are you, are, do you miss cooking? Do you, do you get still to do it enough? or? Well... <clears throat> Uh, I mean, I spend pretty much all day from, you know, 6 or 7 in the morning until 6 at night uh, outside with the horses. And then I do, I combine writing and cooking at night. Luckily, I have a very uh, hungry boyfriend who is more than happy to eat anything that I make. <laughs> Funny how um, that works. Boyfriend today, yeah. husband <laughs> tomorrow. Yeah, if I need to get rid of something, he's happy to take care of it. Um, <laughs> the dog? You know, I, <laughs> I like to have friends over. I have a really nice cabin in the woods, and I like to have friends over at least once a week for a dinner party. And, you know, and I like going to the farmer's market and picking out fresh ingredients and making a menu. And I have my own cookbook that I basically, you know, as I'm going through things over the years, 
if I really, really like a recipe that I like that I've made, I write it down and add any little, um, you know, changes that I've made that work for me. Um, and so I am kind of inspired by my grandmother's recipe book so that I have a little record of all of my quirky recipes that I enjoy. So. See, that's what I do with my blog is those quirky recipes that I've been handed down either through my family or worked on or found in a magazine and tailored, then it goes up on my blog. So I feel you. <laughs> I tried to do that and I felt really bad because I felt like I wasn't taking enough gourmet photos of what I was doing. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I ended up just, you know, doing the handwritten thing. You know, it's hard to take, and I, Kat, you've probably experienced this now as, a, as an official food <laughs> blogger, is it's very difficult to take good pictures of food. Oh, it's awful. As you're making it. Yes. yes. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's hard yeah. because you can't always stop. And I'm, you know, usually when I'm doing the recipes, I'm home by myself. So it's really hard to set up a camera. And that's one of my things is I'm really setting up to buy myself a really nice camera because I don't always have access to daylight, which is beautiful for food photography, but it's not always going to be something I have. So there's a lot of things that I'm setting up in the next year to really take it to the next level. But just starting off now, it's taken me a lot of time and a lot of energy to really research how to take good food photography. I'm still not great and I'm the, be the first to admit it, but you have to do a lot of that to learn and kind of adapt with it. But it, it takes, you know, it's fun but it does. It requires a lot of concentration to be able to do it, for hey, sure. Hey, Kate, um, listen to this, and it's so funny that Kat just brought that up because uh, I found earlier on on a website called underthehighchair.com. dot com, and so that gives you a clue as to what this website's about. Um, they had <laughs> they had get this. They had the top ten things to expect when dining with a food blogger. <laughs> and number one was you won't be asked to bring anything except perhaps wine or other beverages. Dinner will be served yep. at three in the afternoon because the natural light is better. Yep. <laughs> Once the meal is ready, it will be marched past you and out the back door for a photo shoot. By the time you get it back, it's 15 minutes later and cold. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yep. I've, I've, I've probably done all of those things to my friends at one point. <laughs> Yeah, and it's funny because the food tours I've taken as of recent, everybody in the group by the end realized that they're not even allowed to touch the platter, that they're entitled to because they paid for their portion, but they had to let me take photos first of everything. So it's just, you kind of <laughs> learn to go with it. <laughs> the life of a food blogger. I know, I know. <laughs> well, I think we're just about out of time, but Kate, thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, thank you for having me. This has been fun, and, and it's a, you write for Eventing Nation, right? Yes, I'm a full-time staff writer there, so I, I write one or two things every single day, seven days a week. <laughs> then I read it almost every day. <laughs> <laughs> yep, we're pretty fun there. Good, good job. And, of course, uh, just give a little plug here. We have uh, your counterpart. We have Leslie from Horse Nation that comes on our morning show, Horses in the Morning, every Monday morning to talk about the wacky world of horses. So... Oh, Leslie is the funniest. She's the best. Yeah, she does a great job. She has a great job. Talk about that. She sits and Googles funny horse things all day and gets paid for I know. It. So <laughs> it's like, okay, that's a job for you. Yep. <laughs> well, thank you, Kate Samuels. Yeah, thank you. One. Well, what a bu couple good guests. You did a good job setting those up, Kat. Well, thank you. Yeah, I wasn't sure how it was all going to flow together, but I think it went really well. It did. Yes, very good. Well, I have something fun for you guys because I know that, uh, I, well, Kat, I'm not sure about your age, but uh, uh, I, I, and, and Helena is much younger than I am, but I think you're going to relate to this. I found a list of the top 10 uniquely 80s foods. Now, I graduated in 1980 of high school, so... I lived all through these foods, and I'm sure that you guys are going to relate to them, too. But you're going to be surprised that a couple of them only came out in the 80s, and you're going to think they've been around forever. One of them that I was really surprised at is Jawbreakers came out in the 80s. The big balls, wow. you know? I don't, yeah, I remember Jawbreakers. Those. Don't really you remember don't. being in, like, the vending <laughs> machines at, at the grocery store or whatever forever? I mean, I thought that I they never they go bad either. That's no. just the thing. <laughs> no, because they're bad to begin with. Right. <laughs> <laughs> they don't go bad because they start bad. <laughs> 
I, you know, with my teeth nowadays, my old teeth, I couldn't eat a jawbreaker. My life depended on it. Oh my God. What are we going to do? Feed you through a straw? It's going to have to be. Oh, I have that's twins. whining and complaining, Glenn. There's a moratorium on whining and complaining oh, okay. on right. the show. Right. Come on. <laughs> Chocolate, you know what? Just suck on some chocolate and it'll that's, melt that's in your right. mouth. That's right. That I can do. Jawbreakers. I couldn't eat them when I was a kid. <laughs> How about California raisins started in the 80s? Raisins, schmazins. We're talking about chocolate. <laughs> no, raisins but... is health food. <laughs> Jennifer loves chocolate raisins. Chocolate covered raisins. I like raisins. She loves those. That's she bad. loves, when we go to the movies, that's what she gets, raisinets. Yep. Now favorite. I'm getting hungry. All the gourmet talk didn't do it for me, but now we talk about the junky like chocolate that you can get at the gas station. That uh, makes me hungry. One of my favorite things in the whole world started in, in the 80s, too. Number eight on this list, Cool Ranch Doritos. Oh, my gosh. Those are my sister's absolute... I mean, she is so funny because she will hoard them like crazy, but... For me personally, I found they're really great crunched on top of macaroni and cheese. Oh, that'd be good. Amazing. That'd so be good. Really good. <laughs> that would be really good. I crunch them up sometimes. I put them in the food processor and I'll put them in meatballs and stuff. Oh, on chicken too? Mm. Yeah, because it just adds a little zip to it. And, and that's good horseshoe food, horse show food right there. Cool Ranch well, Doritos. And they're also, because of the high fat content, I'm really, I was really getting excited. And I have to remember they're really bad for you, but they're amazing at starting fires. If you don't have like kindling, pretty good stuff. What, you put the Doritos in? Yeah, and you light it, they light instantaneously on fire and they'll keep um, the flame going for a while so you can get your fire started. Did you know that, Helena? Because I, I didn't. Nope. Do you want to know how she found that out or not? I do, kind of. <laughs> well, yeah, you go camping, you have your junk food, you kind of run out of stuff, you try it. Some people will argue with me that Lay's potato chips work better than Doritos. I find the Doritos work better because they burn for longer. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> Tri-colored pasta salad was on the list. You know, I... I'm tough on pasta salad. It's got to be good. I've had some crappy pasta salad, cold pasta salad. I think we all have. Yeah. That and potato salad is just, eh. yeah. I think it's been done a lot. So. And when you go to parties where there's like potluck, do you like take two pieces of it, try it before you put a spoonful of it on a plate? I do. Cause I just, I feel bad. Cause normally I just don't, if it doesn't look like new and interesting, I don't even, I, I hate being that snob, but it's like, you get it. And it's like, then you feel bad because the person will come up and be like, Hey, you've got my pasta salad. What do you think? And I'm like, Oh great. Now I have to be honest. And <laughs> it's never a good opportunity. So I just say, I'm gluten free. I'm sorry. I can't eat your pasta salad. <laughs> I need to start using that one. How about number six on the list? An Orange Julius started in the 1980s. Um, and yeah. I never had ever. That's uh, something that was a Dairy Queen thing, wasn't it? Aren't they they have them. I tried them in Vegas for a show. I think it was Vegas. It was somewhere in California. When I went to, I think it was AAP one year. And I tried them, and I can't say I was very excited about them. But I think it's one of those like kind of nostalgic things that you grow up with, and you're like, oh, my gosh, it's so amazing. And even as an adult, you can appreciate it. But if you're introduced to it as an adult, it might not be as good. <laughs> I love the description here. Creamy plus citrus sounds like a wretched marriage. <laughs> <laughs> But it's not like a creamsicle. Like, you know, those, you kind of get that nice little balance because there's milk and the sherbet. This is just like orange juice and milk. Ugh. Like, it just, I don't know. I never liked I it. I love it. Do you? Oh, I love it. Yes. Yeah. I first, I never heard of it. We didn't have it in like New York, New Jersey when I was growing up. But I first found it um, when I went to college at UMass. And I was like, what is this orange Julia stuff? And you next thing you know, you're sucking it down like there's no tomorrow. Were you putting vodka good. in it or something? No, no I okay. was innocent. This was my freshman year. Okay. Vodka didn't come into my life until my sophomore year. Oh, okay. <laughs> Number five on the list that came out in the 80s was Equal. Equal was the first aspartame pixie dust sold to consumers. Now um, that's dangerous, gross stuff. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Uh, number four, artili artificially flavored fruit snacks. You know the roll-ups and the gushers and stuff like that? And I, my parents, you know, we never got, I never got into them at all. I can't say that I've ever had them, to be honest with you. We got them in our lunch every day when we were growing up, but now I'm like, no, I'd much rather just make my own, but. I just yeah. eat an apple. <laughs> that's like, that's, yeah. yeah. Uh. Tabacola. 
Tab came out <laughs> in the 1980s. Is Tab still around? Yeah. Yeah? I think so. I've seen it randomly in places. Does but anybody I mean, drink it? <laughs> well, I feel like they've got like a lot of those like retro candy stores popping up, and then occasionally you'll see like Tab, you know, cropping up there too. So what? I don't know if you guys still drink cola. I don't do a lot of soda anymore. I used to be a huge Pepsi drinker. I was Pepsi. I couldn't stand Coke, and I drank Pepsi. I don't, Helena, are you? Uh, Pepsi, Diet Pepsi. But no, I don't drink soda. I yeah. Ginger ale, but if I have to have a cola, it'll be... It'll be a Pepsi. But now is but, it pop or soda? See, we were soda in Pennsylvania. Soda in New York. And I was yeah. pop in Buffalo. Yeah. Were you pop in Buffalo? I thought that was more over in a Michigan, Wisconsin no, thing. Oh, we were definitely pop. But huh. then you, Well, they're you, far you, enough up. Yeah. Buffalo's far enough up <laughs> yes, to be... It might as well just be Canada. Canada. <laughs> yeah. I am like Canadian. <laughs> Number two on the list of the things that came out in the 80s was Lean Cuisine started in the 80s. And they still sell those like the millions. I went to the grocery store the other day, and in this cart being pushed by like a 12-year-old, and I'm not kidding you, I was telling Jennifer about it, halfway up the cart was filled, filled halfway up the cart with TV dinners. That was all that was in the cart. Now, there were some lean cuisines, but not all lean cuisines, but halfway up the cart was TV dinners. It, uh, I don't, to me, I guess it's different. Like, I feel like it's so much cheaper to be able to just make your own food and then be able to get like, you know, you plan it out a little bit where you can get second and third meals. But I don't know. I just I, I've never been big into like the frozen meals, but I guess it's not the same for everybody either. Yeah, have you ever done them, Helena? I don't remember, see you. I don't remember you doing frozen meals a lot. No, I, I mean, I think I tried it for like, I don't know, a couple of months back in the 90s and they were just horrible. Yeah, it, it just, just tastes like the box it came in. <laughs> it would take, well, they were frozen, so it, everything would be watered down. There was no flavor. Yeah. Well, in case you're interested, they started out with 10 uh, options of flavors, and now they have more than 100 at Lean Cuisine. Oh, gosh. Another something that came out that's the number one thing and apparently is the best seller of any of them on this list, and it must be a kid thing because I've never had one, and that is a Capri Sun, the little cardboard oh, boxes yeah. of drink juice. Uh, yeah. See, I grew up with those, too. That was another thing that cropped up in my little lunchbox. But then again, I was born in 84, so this is kind of falling into that little area. But yeah. um, now I don't drink them anymore. But I know they're really great for kids. They have, actually, speaking of Capri Suns, they have them for adults now, where you can get them with the alcohol already in it. Alcohol and sugar is never a good idea. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> The Capri Suns, I use bigger. them regularly. <laughs> I use them regularly in Grace's lunch because they're easy to pack yep. and they don't they don't bust open that that easily. And there is a version, you have to read your labels carefully. There is a version that doesn't use any extra sugar or high fructose corn syrup. Oh, okay. So That's the healthier kind of version of Capri Sun. Yeah, you just yeah. gotta read your labels. They were first trademarked in Germany in the fifties, and the pouches became huge at, at uh, German soccer games. Uh, they had them in pouches back then instead of the little cardboard boxes like they have today. And that's how they became popular and came over here in the 80s, uh, the United States. The so, Capri Suns? Yeah, yeah. They're still in pouches. Oh, are they? It's yeah. Kind of like a, oh, okay. What am I thinking of? It's in the little cardboard boxes. Juice everything box? else. Yeah, everything, <laughs> everything else. else. <laughs> everything else. The apple juices, the, everything's in the, the, the boxes. But Capri Suns, Capri Suns and Honest Kids, which is sort of like a healthier version of the Capri Suns. They're in foil pouches. See, that I've so, never had one. random fact about drinks. Did you know that milk in Canada is sold in bags? Really? Yes. That was one of the things, again, because I live so close to Canada, I could never really understand. I, I understand it's a big culture thing, but they literally sell milk in these clear cl plastic bags, and you have a pitcher at home that you'd snip the corner off and then pour your milk out of it. Really? <laughs> yep. To know that. I thought she was going to say, did you know that milk is sold in cows? <laughs> in Canada, uh -uh. milk is sold in cows. Cows, you have to, you have to get your own. <laughs> Comes with built-in pouches, built-in You learned straw. to like it warm. <laughs> yeah, warm. That's the only... What? It, yeah. 
<laughs> well, Kat, this has been a lot of fun. Thank you so much for all the work and putting this together today. We really appreciate it. It's been a fun break for us, too, just talking about food. But I'm getting really hungry, and I need to go eat lunch now. All right, go get some so, chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> now, give everybody your website again. Uh, my website is Eat Your Tart Out, spelled with an E, so it's T-A-R-T-E dot com. Or you can find me on Facebook by searching for Eat Your Tart Out. And, of course, Kat's a regular contributor here. Once a month, she comes on and gives us a recipe here on the Stable Scoop Show, which we really appreciate. You can find all of the information about our show at StableScoop.com. If you'd like to listen to past episodes, all of them are on there back to five years ago. You can go back and listen to the previous episodes. I actually did that. I looked at our stats, uh, Helena. I looked at our stats the other day, and I looked. And remember (laughs) when we had our anniversary? We had hundreds of people go back and listen to that first episode. Um, oh, really? Yes. Oof. I know. <laughs> it was Oof. really bad. Uh, I'm sorry about that, and I apologize to everybody. They probably haven't yeah, been back. Sense, but... <laughs> That's Glenn's twisted sense of humor, people. Yes. <laughs> and, but we uh, love him anyway. <laughs> thank you to our sponsors. Our sponsors today were Equisketch and Kentucky Performance Products. Don't forget to get the app. We have uh, hundreds of thousands of people now downloading the app. Just go to the App Store at iOS or Android on your phone. Search for Horse Radio Network. It's the easiest, simplest way to listen to the shows. Uh, it's so easy, it's free, and you'll find it there. Thank you, Kat. Thank you, Helena. That's it for this week. That is plenty, but there will be more next week. Until then, happy scooping. Covered in chocolate.